There we go. We look like we're live on here. So <clears throat> it is nine o'clock in Nova Scotia, Canada. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Lawrence Taylor. Uh, this is another Earth Live Lessons. Um, thank you, Liz Daly, so much for putting this on, getting all us cats put together <laughs> in the technology. Um, it's quite a feat and uh, really enjoy uh, being able to do this. So uh, my topic today is documenting changing seas in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, and I do that as a biologist and underwater photographer. Now, I sort of came honestly uh, into this profession. My um, father was a uh, underwater photographer. Or, sorry, my father was a freelance cinematographer, and my mother was a journalist. So I learned the documenting component as well as um, the communications component. So it was, um, I learned early then um, to not only document, but in my TV experience, that you had to also pitch, tell stories um, in order to get work to go. So I'm gonna turn that off for one second. There we go. Uh, there we go, I don't want any feedback. Um, so uh, I wanted today I'm going to show you is some of the footage um, that I've documented and some of the changes and some of the stories that I've been able to tell over the years. So when you're telling stories, it's always good to have a good solid background in what you're talking about. And one of the best books that I found early on um, was a book called um, Sea of Slaughter by um, Farley Mowat. He's a Canadian author who passed away uh, a number of years ago. But the great thing about this book is that it tells you about what the seas were like when the Europeans first came to um, this region. The number of species and the number of animals per species. There's that old famous line that um, cod were so thick in our waters that you could dunk a basket into them and just pull them right out of the water. Now, one of the great things I learned from his book was that we actually had walrus off of our shores here in Nova Scotia. Now this I happened to pick up when I was in um, the Arctic a number of years ago, filming thick-billed mirrors. But yeah, this is the skull of a walrus. That's its nostril, its lower jaw. You can see where the tusks fit in down below. Um, it was obviously hunted. There's a bullet hole here and the back of the skull would have then extended out here. But the thing is, there was walrus in Nova Scotia. That's incredible. In fact, uh, someone may correct me, but they were down all the way as far as Cape Hatteras. So they were extended quite far. So the issue back then and up until I got here in uh, 87 was hunting and fishing, particularly the fishing component. Uh, what happened um, uh, not long after I moved here was the collapse of the fisheries and they shut everything down to put a lot of fishermen out of jobs. Now, since then, the biggest issue, there have been exotic invaders that have been an issue, but what's been a real issue for us is um, sea changes, climate change. And in a presentation just a couple of weeks ago at the minister's conference, Dr. Jake Rice really had a term that really sunk in with me, and is that um, marine species are becoming polarized. And what he meant by that is that um, tropical fishes are now starting to push in semi-tropicals more towards the poles. And where this is uh, really evident is within the lobster industry here. Now, Whenever I'm diving and filming, I always collect stuff. I have a little bag and so on. This is a pincer claw from one of our local lobsters, rather a large one. It was kind of fun too, is that obviously this one was in a bit of a kerfuffle, um, but I've never seen scar tissue on a lobster before, but this had some, some of it's dropped away. But changing seas. So New York and Connecticut used to have a large lobster industry. It disappeared completely because all the lobster migrated up to Maine. Maine has the highest average change warming seas anywhere in the world. So now they have a very strong lobster industry. That, though, is getting pushed. And the assumption is that by about mid-century, all of their lobster will be up in Canada. And so what we see then is catches of 20 to 30 percent more lobster now, even in places around um, PEI and off into um, Newfoundland, which is unusual. So we can see how sea change is impacting our waters. 
But let's get into a little bit of underwater photography. So um, I really was enjoying filming uh, marine research, but then found that I could start to pitch stories for television. So one of the very first projects I worked on was for um, CBC Land and Sea, and it was the sinking of the Saguenay, a uh, Canadian destroyer, which was going to become an artificial reef. Now, in the, my sea change components, what's really neat to see is how the sea then affects things that get dropped into the ocean. So you can see the colonizers. So often on our shorelines, a big storm comes through, wipes stuff out, and then it'll slowly recolonize. Well, this ship shows, and I'm just going to run the footage now. I attached the camera right to the bow of the ship, let it go down with the ship. We had another camera on the back. So you can see the deck is nice and clean. And when he went down, it was so brilliantly clean. And then I recorded what went on on the vessel over the next few years. So you can see um, their invertebrates and fish moved in, seaweeds moved in, and encrusting coralline algae then also covered the, the hull of the ship. So it really then became very much of one of my second favorite spots to film is our rocky coastline. Along Nova Scotia, we have these beautiful stands of kelp and to me they're like our underwater rainforest because they have these stipes with big canopy on the top and so animals live on the plants they live around the plants and those hold fast that hold the plants down there are all these great communities of invertebrates that live around them so our seas these are some of the typical animals it's not like the tropics where you get um, big reefs and lots of big colorful fish you got to get a little closer to the ground and you find things like tunicates and the rest so there's wonderful opportunities to film wildlife around our area and it's quite different from tube worms there to this sort of bad hair day sponge now for those of you who are budding photographers um, this is the sort of camera system that i would use um, what I like about it is that the camera fits inside. Um, the housing is aluminum, so this can go down to 300 feet, to which I would not want to go down that far. But it has a whole bunch of um, electronic connectors that help control the camera inside. So I can get the shots just like I'd like. And it, the great thing about this, you're always trying to get as wide an angle uh, shot as you can. I can uh, have an object right in front of the glass element here and still have it in focus. Um, so these are great systems, not necessarily that you want to get, but this is what I've used for shooting um, over the years. And as you can see, it um, this is um, older footage, it's a DV footage, but it still has great resolution. We meet some characters like um, that wolf fish. And I actually, in the sea change component, I, it took me a long time. This is a school of cod. Um, I kept asking fishermen, can I find a school of cod? Can I go and film? So that was some footage of some cod. This is a two-year-old cod that I found one day, and then a one-year-old cod, who unfortunately has a bit of a bend in his tail. So in order to do this sort of work, um, you don't want a shaking cameraman, a cold cameraman. So what um, I always have is a dry suit. And you need to be comfortable filming underwater in a dry suit system because uh, it's uh, it's a little cumbersome. Some people get claustrophobic. You've got the suit on, underwear and all the rest. It can be really strange. Where you don't need a suit is, a number of years ago, I got to go on the SDL. This is the Canadian Navy submersible that was um, decommissioned a few years ago. But at 760 feet, we met a school of juvenile capelin. They've suffered too in the fisheries. They have disappeared and they, for puffins and all these other birds that require them as feed, as well as fish like cod, their disappearance has been very tough on those species. Again, the lobster, one of my favorite subjects. There are some big ones. I've met lobsters with heads as big, or their claws as big as my head. And you can actually have right-handed lobsters and left-handed lobsters. The big guys seem to be pretty chill all the time, unless you mess with their um, little cubby holes. Um, it's the little ones you gotta watch because they'll pinch you all the time. We have some pretty raucous crabs in our areas, and actually the green crab is an exotic invader, and it's done a great deal of damage to um, sea uh, seagrass in our area. It gets into the root systems, tears it apart, and gets rid of that habitat, which is really critical in our areas. Now, if you see, see a fin flopping around in the summer, it's not likely a shark. It's this crazy individual. This is a mola mola, or the, um, the sunfish. They're incredible animals. 
They don't move too fast unless they want to. They just kind of look like they were built by uh, uh, a committee because of all the odd shapes and parts. Others around here, this is bluefin tuna, spectacular animals, absolutely built for speed. They have changed as sea temperatures change. We used to fish them off of southern Nova Scotia. They have now pushed up over the top of um, uh, the province into PEI. And in fact, they're actually seeing, I talked to a boat charter, they're actually seeing thresher sharks up around PEI now, which they never had seen before. Now, this is a bit of a treat. This is Wilma the beluga whale. I'm going to treat you to a little more of her footage a little bit later on. Um, she is a beluga whale. She came to Shetabacto Bay uh, with her mother. Her mother then disappeared. She then remained behind and uh, stayed around a mooring. For three years, this mooring was her home base. Now, as she got more comfortable, she spread further and further um, to go fishing, but um, you could always find Wilma, the beluga whale, around this mooring. Anyways, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, what I wanna do next is, for those of you who want to become underwater photographers, jumping into a dry suit system and the costs and, you know, you have to film in minus one and a half degrees Celsius water some days, it's pretty cool. So you don't want to be in that all the time. What's easier is just with a pair of swim shorts and um, a mask and snorkel, you can actually film in our freshwater systems. And they still are attached to the ocean. They are affected by what goes on in the ocean because we have many fish um, species that move up into our waters via corridors or rivers into our lake systems. So we have two groups. One is like the Atlantic salmon, they will come in and spawn in our waters and then go back to the sea to grow out. Others grow in our lakes like eels for five to 10 years and then go back off to the Sargasso Sea to spawn and then come back to their home waters. So for those of you who are interested in getting started, GoPros are a great little camera system. I mean, it's amazing how the technology has changed. Also something like this, a little Olympus camera. It scares me that a camera like this, you can throw in the water. Just as an old cameraman is like, I can't, I'm very leery throwing this in the water the first time, but they are sealable. Um, you can go underwater. Uh, the thing is, as you become a good cameraman, you know your camera systems inside and out. This will give you 4K, that's good. The thing is, um, I had parked this on a little tripod around some uh, bullhead catfish couple. Um, and the thing was, they were coming so close, they were actually out of focus. Um, so this camera has a bit of a restriction on where um, it can focus on. So it's a fixed focus. So that's one of the downfalls of this camera. With this one, um, if you let it go on autofocus, there's always all this little particulate in the water. So uh, your subject is usually not going to come in focus, whereas all the particulate is. So you have to learn how to override. So that takes a bunch of testing on land to work uh, how to function with this camera. Plus it was obviously not really made for those of us who wear big wetsuit gloves because that's the recording button and it's a little bit of a challenge to try and fire up. Anyways, I'm gonna take us into the freshwater systems and I'm gonna pause right here to show the sea comes in land at some points. This is a grills salmon. So grills means that this salmon um, went off to sea for one year and has come back. If they spend two years or more, they come back as what they call a salmon. So it's gross for one year and salmon for um, uh, additional years. The great thing is these are two brook trout who went to sea at one point. And look at the size of these individuals. They're amazing. They're as big as this um, grill salmon. They also have, because this was shot in October, um, they have big kipes that form on the front. So these are big males here. Now, the thing is, this is not a bathing suit um, sort of shooting instance. This is dry suit territory. This was um, filming in October. The water temperature was about three degrees Celsius, so it was chilly. But the thing was, I simply, with my suit on, some weights, could sit in the water. It was about a foot and a half of water, film these animals, let them do their things. And as a cameraman, and especially if you want to go get behavior, the thing is, you've got to be in the water to catch behavior. So this was a real treat to have these two threes sort of just parked right in front of my camera. A little further downstream, I got this incredible display of agonistic or, you know, I don't like you, you're in my spot. These three brook trout were having an incredible argument, even with these huge salmon. These are big salmon on the spawning grounds. 
So that's a real treat when you get to do this. Again, this was dry suit territory. So uh, it was not the warmest waters at the time, but still lots of activity. These brook trout actually are up around. When the female salmon spawn, they'll actually run in and grab the eggs if any loose ones um, come about. Now, this is a freshwater species, an exotic species in Nova Scotia, the smallmouth bass. Now, its influence on the ocean is that they will eat all the young of shad and gaspro um, that come in and um, hatch during the year. But the great thing about this fish, it's a great one to start with. Early in the spring, it's all temperature driven. Four degrees, the males come in, clear the nest. A couple more degrees, the females come in and they spawn. And then you can follow the whole life cycle of the young animals from eggs to these young little juveniles. They'll lift up and then move into the um, aquatic vegetation. And so you can film that year to year. And these guys sort of go back to the same nest every year. So you can develop this great little repertoire, a little archive of footage and your own story. So that's really very doable in freshwater systems. Um, this poor chap has unfortunately got a bit of uh, tackle in his mouth still. I always get my new lures every spring um, found on the bottom. Another exotic species in Nova Scotia that will eat uh, marine fish that come in um, is the chain pickerel. And it is voracious. Uh, it has really um, knocked down trout and salmon populations um, within um, Nova Scotia. Uh, unfortunately, again, it was introduced because um, many of our waters are very acidic. We don't have the soils to buffer very well. So that's why somebody introduced them. In brackish water, so salt water and fresh water, we have these great little characters. This is a stickleback in his breeding colors. Really nice little animal. I'm just going to fire ahead just quickly because I'm not going to be running out of time fairly soon. This individual. So this is uh, a sea lamprey. They come again to our rivers to spawn as well. Um, I've had a couple of times to work with these animals. Those who will be going the opposite direction though are eels. Um, I enjoy filming eels, particularly in the evening. You can go in with your lights. They all come out in the evening to hunt. And uh, I even have a little sequence here of one hunting in the stream. This individual poor individual had a little bit of um, uh, fungus on its face. Um, and here's an eel actually hunting in the stream looking for small invertebrates. So filming underwater in the freshwater systems, you still get some of a, a marine experience, um, but it's much easier. The gear's easier. You can, uh, as far as the diving gear and the camera gear, great place to get started for you. Then you can move into the sea, but always take lessons, whether it's even for snorkeling, get comfortable, be a good swimmer. Um, always have a partner, always tell people where you're going and when you plan on get back and then take notes. So you know um, where you've been and what things happened uh, while you were out there. So you can always go back and uh, record again in those same spots. So I did say, and we're starting to run out of time. Um, we go back to Wilma, the beluga whale. Um, what I'm gonna treat you to a bit here and I'm just gonna put some volume up. Hopefully I won't blast you out of your seats with this. This little bit of footage is my son meeting Wilma the beluga whale for the very first time. And it's just a piece that I love and he, I get in trouble every time I show it. He doesn't know he's <laughs> going on air today. But anyways, I'll just let him describe his experience seeing Wilma for the first time. Where'd she go? I love that. That gets me in trouble every time I show that. So again, Wilma was an incredible. Some people ask you, what was your very favorite experience? Uh, mine has really was working with Wilma. She's no longer around with us. It's been a number of years. Um, she would actually come to you when you went into the water rather than you having to go out there. And she would actually explore you, which was really interesting. You don't find many animals that do that in the marine environment. And one of the things that I kept finding with her is that as I jumped into the water, 
she uh, she would actually come. We were in a sheltered area, so people in bathing suits would jump in the water in the summer to go see her. She would always come up and do this. She would press her nose against their bare skin, and I figured it was because she had never felt warmth before off an object. So um, she had a naked skin fetish, I always say. <laughs> she really liked to go test swimmers. Anyways, um, I'm running right to the end of my uh, time here. What I would just like to say is thank you again, Lizzie, for putting this together. I hope I hit the right time, Mark. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, do um, use my c-logger um, at gmail.com. Uh, uh, email address. Happy to answer questions at any time. Um, there are, uh, let's see, one question from Mike Dixon. Is there an area you film protected? We are establishing some protected marine areas now, the one in the gully and so on. They're too deep. I couldn't even get to them if I wanted to. So most of our shores are open for divers um, uh, and there's no restrictions. Yes, thank you, Mike Dixon. This is, uh, <laughs> Wilma was the most incredible creature ever. And if you've seen some, there's been at least two more incidents of um, belugas coming into our waters. And if, if anyone's seen it, there was a bit of um, YouTube footage of somebody had dropped their phone over the edge of the vessel and the, the beluga whale came up. In fact, somebody was playing, um, they were throwing a ball out in the water. The beluga was picking it up and bringing it back. So they are really interesting animals, these little marine canaries. Again, thank you, Lizzie, for putting this on. This has been wonderful to share a little bit of my footage. Got to talk a little about changes in the seas around here, how to get into the water and document. Um, do try it out yourself, and um, I'll let Wilma sort of carry us out here. Have a great day, and do enjoy the rest of um, Lizzie's series. See you later from Nova Scotia. Cheers. <laughs>